It's uh, time for us to get started. Uh, let's look at our Bible in Revelation chapter 22, the very last chapter of the book of Revelation. Um, just FYI, next uh, Thursday, uh, we look forward to looking at the book of Daniel. However, uh, I, I will come prepared to teach chapter 1 of Daniel, uh, but before I do that, I'm going to try to answer whatever questions you have uh, with regard to the book of Revelation. So I, I notice that some of you have already um, passed in your, your cards with questions and given them to Leon. Uh, so I'll be looking through those this week. So I don't know how long it's going to take us to answer questions <laughs> next week. Uh, it may take up the whole hour. It may take 15 minutes. I, I really don't know. Uh, but whatever time we have left, we'll, uh, we'll get into the book of Daniel uh, because there's such a great relationship between the book of Daniel <laughs> and the book of Revelation. Um, although at the beginning of Daniel, you won't, you won't notice that. It's not until we get more toward the middle of the book of Daniel that a lot of prophetic uh, events are uh, prophesied there in, uh, in that wonderful Old Testament book. Um, but uh, today we're going to be looking at chapter 22, the very final chapter of the book of Revelation. And the thing to keep in mind is this, whenever you're studying the Bible, is that uh, chapter and verse <laughs> divisions are not inspired now the text is inspired, but chapter divisions and verse numbers are not. They were inserted there by men, and sometimes uh, it, it causes us to kind of break up the thought um, between chapters, and uh, this is one of those occasions because verse 1 of chapter 22 really goes along uh, with the rest of chapter 21 uh, because there is definitely a description um, of the New Jerusalem. Now keep in mind that when you look at prophetic events, the next thing on God's calendar as far as prophecy is concerned is the rapture of the church. That could happen any day. Nothing needs to be fulfilled before the rapture can occur. It can occur at any moment. Um, and so we're not looking for signs, we're looking for the Savior. And there's a big difference. Uh, and so the rapture can occur at any time. If, if I understand prophecy correctly, one of the things uh, that, that we will need to keep in mind is this, that once the rapture occurs, the tribulation will begin on earth. We know from Scripture, from both the Old and the New Testament, we're talking about a, a seven-year period. And during that seven-year period, there will be much destruction. We've already gone through all of that in the book of Revelation. But at the end of the tribulation period, then we will see the return of Jesus Christ to earth. Keep in mind that in the, the rapture, he doesn't actually come to earth. He comes in the air, and then he raises the dead in Christ. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But then after the tribulation period, Jesus comes back, and he sets up his millennial kingdom. There's no reason for us to think that that millennial kingdom uh, is, is just a, a picture. It is, a, it is an actual event. It is a thousand year period with Jesus Christ reigning on earth. Satan will be bound. The beast and the false prophet will have been cast into the lake of fire. Satan will be loosed after the millennium, after that thousand year period. Just very briefly, he'll try to rebel, um, but the Lord will put him down and he will be cast into the lake of fire. But then after the millennial period is over and uh, Satan is cast into the lake of fire, there will be, of course, the uh, judgment of the nations and the beginning of what we call the eternal state. And Revelation 21 and 22 
are really focusing on that eternal state. What is it going to be like when it comes to eternity for God's people? Now, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that there are so many things that, that the Apostle John, who is the author under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in writing the book of Revelation, things that he just really could not grasp, so he put it down in things that, that he um, could not just understand, but things that, that came to his mind whenever he heard what to write down. And so as we said at the very beginning of our study, there are, are lots of, of pictures in the book of Revelation. Um, just as Jesus taught that way um, when he spoke in parables. But um, we believe it is as literal as it could possibly be um, when we get to these two chapters of Revelation, um, chapter 21 and chapter 22. So notice that it talks about, if you'll just back up for a couple of moments um, and, and look at verse 23 of chapter 21. If you look at uh, verse 23, uh, hey, there's a seat up here, Larry. Um, look at verse 23. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then, verse 1 of chapter 22, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. Now keep in mind, we understand that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. That's what is ahead for us, a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Because the new heaven, I mean the old heaven and the old earth, have actually been corrupted by the presence of Satan. Of course, keep in mind, Satan uh, at one time uh, lived in heaven, he was known as Lucifer, the bright and shining one. Uh, many believe that he at one time was kind of like second in command, um, that he had uh, positions of authority in heaven and he rebelled and he with a third of the angels uh, were cast out of heaven. Um, these are the angels that actually became what we know today as demons. Um, but here's the thing to keep in mind. Because there is a new heaven and a new earth, things are going to be drastically different. We try to picture them from where we are today, and it's really difficult to do that because there are going to be things that are so different from what we have experienced, but there will be enough that will help us to really um, at least comprehend somewhat of what it tells us here in the book of Revelation. Um, but if you think about what I just read in these first three verses of Revelation 22, here's what it sounds like and here's what it appears to be. It, it appears to be a, uh, um, I, I guess the way to, to put it is a reversal, a reversal of the curse that God placed on the earth. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. In order to understand that, we have to go to the book of Genesis. Um, it, it's interesting that what happened in Genesis is going to be turned around in the book of Revelation. 
So when we think about this new creation, the new earth and the new heaven, it is actually a reversal of what happened when the ground was cursed. Um, also with regard to, to a river, it, it talks about in verse 1, he showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now there are a number of Old Testament passages that talk to us about a river. Um, I think about the, the 46th Psalm. In, in Psalm 46, it, it talks about um, a river. This is um, really one of the most precious of, of the Psalms, is Psalm 46. It starts out by saying, God is our refuge and strength. He's a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. He's saying, no matter what happens to the earth physically, um, God's going to be our refuge. He's going to be our strength, and we won't fear. Why? He says in verse 4 of Psalm 46, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. Now, when we look at Genesis chapter 2, we, we read in there um, about what we read in Revelation 22. In, in Genesis chapter 2, it says this, The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is what God created. This is before Adam and Eve fell, before they sinned. And so keep in mind, he created that garden. We know it as the Garden of Eden. And he made uh, every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. So we, we know right from the beginning, the perfect creation, long before sin entered, there was not only a river, but there was also trees. Trees that were beautiful and trees that provided good food. But of course, if we read on in the book of Genesis, we, we discover uh, that in chapter 3, um, after Adam and Eve sinned, Here's what God said to Adam. He said this, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Um, in pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. But notice that God cursed the ground. And, and before the sin of Adam and Eve, the ground was not cursed. But because of their sin, um, it was cursed. So we go back to Revelation chapter 22. And we read um, of, of a river, um, though uh, it says, uh, uh, he showed me the river of the water of life. I think this is, once again, this is a, a reversal of the curse. We're going to see that uh, when sin is no longer present. So you have that curse reversed. You have that river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and it, through the middle of the street, and on either side of the river. Uh, I kind of picture this like a boulevard. 
Um, and on either side of the street, um, there is a tree. Now, you've heard of the Fruit of the Month Club, right? <laughs> um, well, I don't think it, it actually came from Scripture, but, but, right, but, but right here it says that, it, it says on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And that immediately brings up a question. Why do we need healing? I don't think there's going to be any sickness uh, in, in, in eternity. Uh, there's not going to be a, any diseases. Actually, the term can also be translated health. In other words, what God is providing for us, uh, I'm so glad. I think we're going to be able to eat in eternity. Um, and I don't think we'll get fat. Uh, but, but, but I, you know, uh, that, that's for this side of eternity. The other side of eternity, I think we're going to be able to eat freely. Of course, there's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. I think it's going to be a glorious feast. But here, it actually talks about um, the fruit of these trees uh, are going to be there for the, for the health of the nations. And no longer, verse 3 says, no longer will there be anything accursed. A reversal of what God had to do in Genesis chapter 3 when he cursed the ground. And so um, this wonderful picture of eternity, there won't be any curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. And so one of the things we need to keep in mind when it comes to this new Jerusalem, um, new Jerusalem will be the capital to me, uh, the capital of the world. Um, people will flock uh, to the city of Jerusalem. You know, God chose Jerusalem. Um, that was his choice uh, way, way back. Jerusalem was his city. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is the city of our God, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, today, there's, uh, there's a battle going on in Jerusalem. I'm not talking about a, a physical battle right now, but there's a battle as far as who's to be in charge. And, uh, you know, God is going to win. I mean, there's just no question about it. It's, it's going to change. It's going to be uh, in the hands of those to whom it rightfully belongs. Uh, and that is the Jewish people. And people will, f will still flock uh, to Jerusalem, I believe, even in eternity. I mean, the, the, the way the, the world is described, there's going to be so much room uh, in the world, but we'll be able to travel um, into to the city of Jerusalem, uh, I believe, as often as, as we want to uh, in eternity. But here's something else that I think is going to be so different in eternity, not only the fact um, that we will be always healthy, um, we'll always have um, the fruit of the, uh, of the tree, um, the tree of the, the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life um, are going to be there, and here's something that's going to be different. Look at what it says in verse 4 of Revelation 22. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Now, if we remember what it says in the Old Testament, um, just one of the instances in the, in the life of Moses, in Exodus chapter 33, in Exodus 33 and the 20th verse, it says that no one can see God and live. No one can see his face and live. Um, as a matter of fact, the Apostle John, in, in John chapter 1, he talks about the fact no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten of the Father, he has revealed him or declared him. So one looks in the face of Jesus Christ, but no one, at, at particularly in, the, in this day and age, can actually look at the face of God. Well, keep in mind what the scriptures say, that God is a spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So no one can look at the face of God and live. Remember um, in um, Exodus chapter 33, Moses said, God, I, I, I just want to see you. Will, you. will you let me see your glory? 
And remember how God responded to him? He says, I'm, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock and I'm going to pass by. And he said, you can look at my back when I pass by, but no one can see my face and live. And, and why is that? It's because of the fact that man is sinful, God is pure and holy and righteous, and no one can look upon him and, and live. However, I believe in the eternal state. That's going to change. That's going to change because it says in verse 4, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. In other words, what he's saying is everybody will be recognized as belonging to God, belonging to him. And uh, there, there have been so many times, and, and in the Psalms in particular, um, in, in Psalm, um, I think it's Psalm 17, um, it, it talks about that. Um, Psalm 17, verse 15, it says, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness when I awake. I shall be satisfied with your likeness. Um, in, in Psalm 11, it also talks um, about seeing the face uh, of God. Uh, that was the, the desire of, of God's people. Um, in in Psalm, <clears throat> Psalm 11, uh, look at what it says in verse 7. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Psalm 27, it says, One thing have I asked of the Lord. Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to meditate or inquire in his temple. So one of the things that you'll see in, in the Psalms especially is the desire to actually see um, the face of God. Now, um, in this eternal state, the, the prayer of, of Numbers chapter 6, I think, will be answered. What is, what is the prayer in Numbers chapter 6? Well, we actually call it as a benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. And what else? The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. See, that is going to definitely be answered in the eternal state. The Lord will lift up his countenance. Uh, 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 upon you. He'll make his face to shine upon you. You'll be able to see him face to face. That's one of the wonderful things about going to heaven. Not, not just to see the beauty as described here in chapter 21 and chapter 22. Even beyond the beauty of all that God has made is to be able to look upon the face of the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Someday we are going to be able to look into the face uh, of our God and the curse will be removed. And that, that uh, prohibition of not being able to see the face of God will change. This is why the scriptures say, blessed are the pure in heart. Uh, one of the Beatitudes, what did, what did Jesus say? Blessed are the pure in heart for what will happen? They shall see God. Um, what a joyous time that is going to be. But then, you know, it's interesting that, that the book of Revelation actually begins with a prologue and it ends with an epilogue. So now the prologue is the first three verses of chapter 1. The prologue of the book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. That's the prologue. 
to the book of Revelation. And then, of course, it begins in, in verse 4, John, to the seven churches uh, that are in Asia. So you have that prologue in chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. But then you have an epilogue, and, and we see that epilogue um, actually um, that begins in, in verse 6. But before we get to verse 6, let me read verse 5. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. See, that's hard for us to comprehend. We don't think of a person as an actual light. But I think what it is re referring to is that the glory of the Lord is all that we will need in order to see what we need to see. The glory of the Lord. This is why there won't be any need for the sun, for a lamp, for the sun. Uh, for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. So we, we are given a description of what it's going to be like, even though it's very difficult for us to comprehend the glory of it all. But in the epilogue, there, there is what we refer to as final invitations. The epilogue of the book, the, the last few verses that really sum up um, what it is that the Lord wanted us to understand uh, about going to glory. And the epilogue is verse 6 all the way through verse 12. And this is kind of the, the capstone, if you will, of all that has been said in the book of Revelation. All of this is leading up to the glorious eternal state that God has prepared. You see, eye has not seen, neither has ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. He's revealed them to us by his spirit. So how does God reveal the things that he's prepared us for or prepared for us? He's revealed it to us through his word. And we need the Holy Spirit to help us understand the word of God. This is why um, eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. He's revealed it to us by his spirit. And how does the Spirit work? The Spirit works through the Word of God. This is why um, he, he talked to us um, in that upper room when he sat with his disciples and said, it, it's to your advantage that I go away. It's to your advantage that I go to heaven because when I go to heaven, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And he will what? He will lead you into all truth. We can read about that in John chapter 16. Um, but he says, when the Spirit comes, he's going to lead you into the truth and will help us to understand the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Eye hasn't seen it and ear hasn't heard it. So he gives this epilogue um, in uh, chapter 22, verse 6. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, does that ring a bell? Uh, because of what we just said in, in chapter 1. He said, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and those who hear and those who keep what is written therein. So what he says in the prologue, he's also saying in the epilogue, he's saying, blessed are, is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And then John says in verse 8, I, John, and the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. In other words, don't worship me as an angel, worship God. 
And of course, we know uh, the very fact from the prologue that he says that he made it known by sending his angel to the servant John. So John identifies himself at the beginning of the book. John identifies himself at the end of the book. You see how this prologue and epilogue um, kind of go together. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And then, of course, um, the angel says, don't worship me, worship God. And he said to me, verse 10, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. The time is, now, that, that word that's translated near, it's a very interesting term in the original language. It actually carries with it the idea that the time is sudden. It's sudden. In other words, this is not really near in the sense of chronology. It's near in the sense that it can happen at any time and it can happen suddenly. And I think that's exactly what, what's going to happen. You know, the day is coming, the, the Lord Jesus said, the day is coming when they that are in the grave shall hear his voice. And of course, they will be uh, caught up together with him. But um, there's a very interesting comparison between the prophecy in the book of Daniel and the prophecy in the book of Revelation. Because you'll notice that it says in the 10th verse, do not, the angel said to him, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. But what did he say to Daniel? Well, in Daniel chapter 12, the last chapter of the book of Daniel, it says, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Keep in mind when the book of Daniel was written, back in the 600s B.C. Back in the 600s B.C., what, what did God say to Daniel? He said, seal up this prophecy. Um, don't open it up at all. And he says, but many will run to and fro and knowledge will increase. Well, I'll tell you, knowledge certainly has increased since the 600s B.C. That, that's exactly what God was referring to. And, and as time went on, only God knows the day or, or the hour of the return of Jesus Christ. Um, as, as a matter of fact, the, the disciples, just like you and me, the disciples were very curious about when all of these events will take place. When is this going to happen? They even questioned the Lord Jesus. Uh, over in Matthew 24 and 25, um, where that, that uh, focus on the uh, end times, referred to as the Olivet Discourse. The disciples said, when's this going to happen? And the, and the Lord Jesus talks to them, and he says, no man knows the day the hour, and neither does the Son, but the Father only. Um, and that day is up to the Father, and nobody knows the day or the hour. This is why we, we ought to live as if Jesus Christ were coming back today. But we ought to serve him as if he's not coming for another hundred years. You know, you live as if he's coming today, but we work as if he's not coming for a long time. In other words, we use the time that he's giving us to share his word, to share the gospel, to lead other people to Christ, to live a godly life in order to bring honor and glory to him. And so when John hears his words, uh, this word, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evil doer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. What does he mean by that? What, what is he saying um, with regard to all of that? What he's making reference to is the fact that time will go on as the way it is until the Lord comes back. 
And, and so when he says, let the evildoers still do evil, let the filthy still be filthy, and let the righteous still do right and the holy still be holy, he's saying, as time goes on, it'll remain as it is until, um, until the sun comes back. And he uh, ends that epilogue by saying in verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon. Bring my recompense with me, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. So the epilogue to the book of Revelation is saying, keep the coming of Jesus Christ in mind. Keep the return of the Lord in mind um, all of your days. You see, in this epilogue, in verses 6 through 12, He's no longer describing, he's no longer describing the new Jerusalem. In, the, in these verses from 6 through 12, he's saying, in light of what I have just shared with you, in light of what you have read in the entire book of Revelation, in light of that, let it affect the way you live. And of course, isn't that true? This is what the scriptures ought to do for us. The scriptures are given to us in order for us to understand how God wants us to live. He wants us to live a life that is pleasing in his sight. He wants us to live a life that is not dominated by the flesh. You see, that, that's the whole difference between a believer in Jesus Christ and an unbeliever. Uh, one who has been born of the Spirit. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus? Nicodemus was that ruler of the Jews. He was probably the most religious man around in Jerusalem at the time. And, and Nicodemus, he was curious. He says, no, no one can do these miracles that you're doing uh, unless God is with them. And so Nicodemus was real curious. What is with this man, Jesus? And what's with this man that people are flocking to when they're listening to his teaching? And, and they're witnessing the miracles that he's performing. What is this all about? And that's when Jesus says to him, Nicodemus, you're a ruler of the Jews and, and, and you don't understand these things? In other words, he's saying to Nicodemus, you know what, you have had the Old Testament scriptures. You have not only read the Old Testament scriptures, you have studied the Old Testament scriptures and it hasn't gotten through to you yet. And he's saying to him, you must be born again. You must be born anew. And even at that statement, Nicodemus was puzzled. He says, can I enter my mother's womb the second time and be born? He thought he was talking about a physical birth. But Jesus said, no. He said, you need to be born of the Spirit. You need the Spirit of God to come and dwell you. How is that going to happen? When a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ, recognizes him as the Son of God, recognizes him as the Savior who died in their stead. And the very fact that he died and rose again was in order to pay the penalty of an individual sin. But it's not automatic. You know, it, 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 it's not because you're a human being, Jesus died for you. No, it's because you have reached out to him in faith. It has to be a personal decision. It, it, it's not just the fact that, oh, I know that Jesus died. Well, even the devil knows he died. You know, that, that's, that's the thing. Um, it's not a matter of having head knowledge of the truth. There's a big difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. And uh, I, I don't know who started it, but it's been around for years and years that people miss salvation by about 18 inches between the, the space between the head and the heart. Uh, because it's one thing to understand the facts, but it's another thing to actually commit one's life to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I want you to come into my life to forgive my sin. I realize I don't deserve salvation. I realize that I am a sinner. 
And you might say, well, I haven't murdered anyone, I haven't robbed a bank, but that doesn't matter. The truth of the matter is we all love ourselves and we all do what our flesh wants to do as opposed to doing what God wants us to do. And so it's a matter of turning from your sin. This is why Jesus kept preaching while he was here on earth. He talked, he says, look, repent and believe the gospel. What does that word repent means? It's more than just feeling sorry for your sin. Godly sorrow works repentance, but it's more than being sorry for your sin. It means making a 180 degree turn. Instead of living for ourselves, we live for Jesus Christ. We live for him. God, use us whatever way you want to use us. Um, help me, Lord, to live the kind of life that brings honor and glory to you. And this is why he, he talked about the fact, don't love the world, neither the things that are in the world. Then he describes what the world is. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that's not of God, but it's of the world. And the world is passing away, and all of its lust, but he who does the will of God, what? Abides forever. So there's a big difference. And this is why you see this epilogue in the book of Revelation. Uh, he, he says, look, these words are faithful and true. They're trustworthy and true. Uh, which, by the way, earlier in chapter 19, when he talked about the, the, the coming of Jesus Christ from heaven, he says it referred to him as the one who was what? Faithful and true. And so you have the, the living word of God faithful and true, you also have the written word of God that is faithful and true. And, and so he says, he's coming and blessed is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy. So he says, I'm, I'm coming soon and I'm bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. Um, in Isaiah chapter 40, chapter 40 is a, is a wonderful chapter um, it, it talks about comfort for God's people. I, I don't know if I shared this with you before, but you know the book of Isaiah is like a mini Bible. Um, you know that the Bible is made up of 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. And of course there's a big difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Guess what? In the book of Isaiah, the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah are all about judgment. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah all talk about the fact that man needs a savior. And then the last 27 chapters of the book of Isaiah are like the New Testament because it gives the truth of how salvation is made available. And so you, you kind of have, just like there are 66 books in the Bible, there's 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. Verse 39, judgment. Last 27, blessing and comfort. And so in Isaiah chapter 40, um, it says in verse 6, A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not, say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He's coming with his reward. Remember how we gave a title to each of the last four chapters of the book of Revelation? Um, we, we talked about the fact that uh, he returns in chapter 19. He reigns in chapter 20. Uh, he restores in chapter 21. And he rewards 
in chapter 22 um, because he says in verse 12, I am coming soon bringing my reward or my recompense with me. I'm bringing my reward to repay each one for what he has done. In the 17th chapter of, of the book of, of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 17, um, you may be familiar with verse 9 because Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked. Who can understand it? But then in verse 10 he says, I the Lord search the heart and test the mind and give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So all throughout scripture, we're reminded of the fact that the Lord is coming back and the Lord is coming back to reward both evildoers and, and those that do uh, good. You know, the reward is going to be based uh, upon which category one finds himself in. And we are so thankful that when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are looked upon as if we are Jesus Christ. This is why the scripture talks about being in him when we come to faith in Christ. So he gives this epilogue, I'm coming soon and my reward is with me. And then he adds a postscript. So, so you have both an epilogue and then you have a postscript. And what's the postscript? Well, it begins in verse 13. And he says, I am Alpha, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Um, two other times he, he says that same thing. In chapter 1, verse 8, he says the same thing, that he is the Alpha and the Omega. The, the first letter of the Greek alphabet and the last letter of the Greek alphabet, the Alpha and the Omega. Um, and, and he says it again in chapter 21, verse 6, that he's the Alpha and the Omega. And he said, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. No, that's an interesting term in verse 14. He said, blessed are those who wash their robes. Of course, we think of washing as something that, that is cleansing. And he actually uses that term to describe the believers in the city of Corinth. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he makes reference to those who have washed their robes, if you will. This is why he says, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life. So how does one wash their robe? Well, we come to faith in Jesus Christ and we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. And, and notice what it says in, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, um, beginning at verse 9. Um, he says this, he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, or idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, what does he mean? That anybody that has done any of this can never enter the kingdom of God? No. But he's giving a general uh, overview, if you will, of the sins of mankind. But notice what he says in verse 11. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. But, but, you were washed. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's what conversion is. Well, being washed is another term for being converted or coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Obtaining salvation through faith in Christ is one who is washed. And so he says, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life. Of course, we read about that in, in the very first verse of, uh, of, of chapter uh, 22, the second verse, where he talks about the, the tree of life. 
And then he says in verse 15, outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. He talked about that in chapter 21 as well. He's giving a general overview, if you will, of those who uh, do not belong to Jesus Christ, those who have not come to faith in him. And he says in verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. Um, notice that earlier in verse 8, John identified himself. Um, so we know sometimes the angel is speaking, sometimes John is speaking, but here in verse 16, the Lord Jesus wanted us to know that he was saying this to us, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. Because uh, remember, um, chapter 2 tells us, begins what? The seven letters to the churches of, of, uh, of Asia. Uh, and, and so here we are seeing that the beginning and the end of the book of Revelation is kind of being tied together. So the Lord Jesus said that, that I have sent my angel to testify um, these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. We, we learn from the book of Numbers chapter 24. In Numbers chapter 24, it, it talks about the, the bright and morning star that is coming. It was another um, indication uh, about the Messiah, about uh, the Savior of the world. He's referred to as, as the bright and, and morning star. Um, and then notice that beginning in verse 17, there is a final, final invitation, a final invitation before the book closes. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. Now, we know who the Spirit is. That's a reference to the Holy Spirit of God. You know, whenever a person feels conviction for sin, whenever, whenever they are under conviction uh, for sin, what's happening? The Spirit of God is convicting them. And so this is why he says, the Spirit says come, and the bride says come. Now, who is the bride? The bride of Christ are believers. And so other believers are testifying. They're saying to those that don't know Christ, come, come and believe him. Come and put your faith and trust in Christ alone as your only hope for salvation. So the Spirit says come, and the bride says come, and then notice what he says also, and let the one who hears say come. The one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. You see, salvation is not earned. Uh, I mean, this is, this is where the world has it all wrong. You talk to the average person today, and they think that they can earn their salvation by their behavior. Salvation can never, ever be earned. It can be received by faith, but you can't earn it because you can't pay for it. No matter how good your works are, they will never be good enough because they're not done by a perfect, sinless person. And, and this is why the, the scripture is so clear about let him come who desires to take the water of life without price. And, and this isn't anything new because in the book of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 55, uh, notice what the Lord says, Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thought. And let him return unto the Lord and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. 
You see, come to the one without money and without price because the price has already been paid when Jesus died and rose again. And then he gives a, a final warning. Look at what he says in verse 18. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He was saying, I'm very serious about my word. I'm very serious about the scriptures. And if anyone who adds to them or takes away from them, they will pay the price. They will suffer the consequences. And let me tell you, just about every cult and ism adds to Scripture. I mean, you think today, you think about people who believe in Christian science. Oh yeah, they like the Bible, but they also like science and health and key to the Scriptures written by Mary Baker Eddy. Uh, you think of uh, the Mormon Church. Oh yeah, yeah, we like the Bible, but uh, here you need to hear what the Book of Mormon has to say. Uh, or you need to read the Pearl of Great Price, um, adding to the scriptures. Um, you, you think of uh, the Muslim faith, oh, you've got to read the Koran. Uh, I mean, think of what Jesus is saying here. If you add to this book, and then he says, if you take away from what's in this book. I mean, go to just about every university, in the United States, and they will say, oh, well, the Bible is just a myth. You don't really need to, to, to read that book. That's, that's not for today. Well, let me tell you, they're in very serious trouble if they take away from God's Word. See, this is why it's so important for you and me. And I don't need to tell you, you're here. You know, you're here to study God's Word, and that's what we ought to do. We ought to make this part of our lives, not, not just in formal Bible studies like this, but open the pages of scripture every day. Even if you just read a verse a day or a chapter a day, just make the word of God part of your daily life. He who testifies, verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And then uh, I love the way that John ends his book. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Amen. And keep in mind that grace, a way to understand grace, G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's really what grace is. And I always want to make sure people understand the difference between grace and mercy. Mercy is withholding what you really deserve, and grace is giving you what you don't deserve. And we're so grateful that we have a gracious God. Now, Lord willing, next Thursday, um, I will try to answer whatever questions you might have with regard to Revelation, and then in whatever time we have left over, we'll begin our studies in the book of Daniel. But let's have a word of prayer together. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we are so grateful this morning for the love wherewith you have loved us. Your word tells us that greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And we thank you, Father, for what the Lord Jesus did for us when he bore in his own body our sin on Calvary's cross. Thank you, Father, that you were satisfied with his offering and that you raised him from the dead, that he was not only delivered for our offenses, but raised again for our justification. And we thank you for the hope that we can have in eternity because of what Jesus did for us. I pray, Lord, for everyone that's here today, I pray that they have made that crucial decision to turn from sin and place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and he alone as their only hope for eternity. We thank you for the privilege you give us of opening the pages of Scripture together because we know that the entrance of your word gives life and it gives light. 
So help us, Father, to live according to what you have described for us in your word. Dismiss us from this time together with your blessing, we pray, and we'll give you the thanks and praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.